So, Roman, shall we start? Okay, let's okay. start. So, my name is Enrique Quintana. I'm the chair for the session three of the Teropar workshop. We have a first uh, keynote, Patal Benun, uh, that will be followed by two presentations. And this will go uh, until three o'clock, more or less. So let me start by introducing Tal Benun. Tal received his uh, master and PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he worked on random environments for GPU-based HPC clusters and programming abstractions for massively parallel architectures. He's currently postdoctoral researcher at the Scalable Parallel Computing Laboratory, led by Torsten Hoffler, that you, who probably many of you know, at ATH Zurich. Tal has performed over the past few years relevant contributions on application of deep learning uh, techniques and a parallelization of the distributed neural networks on clusters. But uh, whoever it looks like today, he's going to talk about something different, a different interest of him. How to obtain portable performance of heterogeneous architectures by decoupling scientific computation from the underlying computer architecture. So Tal, please go ahead. All right, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. So yes, this is a topic that I've been working on for pretty much since my master's degree, uh, heterogeneous uh, architectures. I guess for the past decade, we've been seeing a revolution in HPC, uh, a figurative explosion of architectures that we can use. And this is uh, now becoming quite a big problem. Uh, this is um, something that you know, every architecture is unique on its own. And we've even seen talks here today about how two different uh, models of GPU basically uh, behave very differently and should be optimized accordingly. And so as researchers, we must stay ahead of the curve and try to think of new ways to program that uh, might help, you know, before this problem becomes uh, an insurmountable um, obstacle. So data centric parallel programming is a programming model that is uh, designed to try to address this problem. And this is essentially a new uh, programming flow. So from the basics of, of how we, we changed programming today and all the way down to an intermediate representation that allows to flexibly map to different ar architectures. So, so a hardware like CPUs, GPUs, and also FPGAs and Today, I'm going to show you that and the framework that we've uh, developed uh, on top of that, which is called the DACE framework. So let's begin. Okay, so first, uh, as most of you already know, uh, the compute uh, architectures are becoming faster in terms of computation, but data movement uh, remains expensive. This is you know, obviously a limitation given to us by physics. But this is uh, so extreme nowadays that multiplying two numbers uh, is three orders of magnitude cheaper than moving those two numbers into the processor to multiply. Of course, this problem becomes much worse when we go to distributed architectures where the problem increases exponentially. And to top it all off, uh, we have different customized uh, processing units, for instance, tensor cores within NVIDIA GPUs or TPUs and even processors on uh, peripherals like network cards and reconfigurable architectures uh, such as FPGAs. So this is becoming a major problem. This is becoming a major problem also from the software engineering perspective, where the once omnipotent computational scientist uh, who could you know, write the entire program and, and run that, now instead uh, two roles are emerging in many computational sciences. And this also includes deep learning, but, but a lot in scientific computing. And what we're seeing is that those two roles are the main scientists who know what to compute and the performance engineers who know how to compute it efficiently. Now, unfortunately, the two roles are acting on the same code for most of the time. And this is becoming a real problem for maintainability. So for instance, when a new hardware architecture comes out, a performance engineer must massage their code and really sometimes do a complete rewrite in order to fit a hardware architecture, even if it's just a new model from the same, uh, from the same company. And so even switching between two different kinds of GPUs can be very uh, cumbersome in terms of uh, development effort. And on the other side, uh, since this goes both ways, the main scientists 
they at some point get to a point where they cannot understand the code that they're processing because of all of the optimizations. So the use of libraries like MPI and CUDA and other programming languages, multiple programming languages in the same uh, environment, but basically um, make the code a lot more bloated and it's really hard to find where the actual computation sometimes takes place. So if we look at the performance engineer and what their role is today of a performance engineer for a given application, we see that no matter the hardware architecture we're looking at, whether it's uh, multi-core CPUs with the vectorization optimizations and um, optimizations for um, high cache utilization, or whether we're looking at GPUs where we want to minimize warp divergence, and even FPGAs when we want to really uh, optimize the number of uh, round trips that we have between the actual circuit and the external DRAM, which leads to interesting circuit design patterns like uh, systolic arrays and pipelining um, in a more uh, general term. Uh, as you can see, none of these optimizations actually have anything to do with the computation itself. Now, you can even claim that high performance optimization mostly nowadays is all about optimizing the data movement. And if you can take these two problems, the fact that we have all of the optimizations being around data flow and the fact that we have these two roles that exist, I mean, we cannot deny that they exist. How can we design maybe a different programming workflow that can support both of these at the same time? And so this is how we ended up with the data centric uh, programming uh, model. It's uh, something we've been working on at uh, SPCL at ETH Zurich for a while. There are a lot of contributors to this project, some of whom I mentioned in the uh, title slide, but there are many more. And so the, the idea behind this kind of uh, interface is that it starts at the uh, most basic level, a uh, separation of concerns, even at the basic programming phase, where we have two sets of files or two sets of codes that we want to work with. So a domain scientist, they work with the input code, right? We talked about how, or sorry, what to compute. So we can use different front ends in different programming languages like Python, TensorFlow, other domain specific languages fall into place here. And uh, for instance, for other deep learning uh, frameworks. And this goes into a basically scientific front end that builds an intermediate representation for the performance engineer to work on. Now, as opposed to other intermediate representations that you may know from let's say compiler analysis uh, what we think is the right approach, at least with this representation, is that uh, we try to promote a completely white box approach. So as opposed to you know, intermediate representations are, that are part of compilers that you write passes, optimization passes, and then they may run or may not run. But as a performance engineer, uh, sometimes you have no idea why they're not running and you would have to really try to adapt your code such that it works. Here we show exactly the representation of the program as, uh, as basically revolving around data movement. So I'll talk about this in a bit. Uh, we call this data centric representation stateful data flow multigraphs. And as you can see this uh, representation, you can see all the optimizations that you can uh, perform and they are expressed as graph transformations. So either programmatic transformations that you implement or just manual manipulation of the graph and all that without changing the original source code. And then subsequently, a performance engineer can then try to map it into a system. And our day's framework supports uh, CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and uh, you can inspect the performance via instrumentation and other tools. And with that, keep optimizing in a, like a closed uh, feedback loop. Now about maintainability, uh, the reason why we have these two separate uh, code bases is that the domain scientists can still see their original code as the you know, scientific computations, while the uh, manipulations to this intermediate representation are stored as deltas. So in that sense, uh, we maintain the maintainability by uh, having the performance engineer save uh, the original graph plus all the transformations and then the domain scientists can even modify their input code. And as long as these deltas still apply, as long as these transformations still apply, 
they would still um, keep having the, the same uh, you know, performance more or less. And if a new hardware comes out, the performance engineer could just branch out from the uh, deltas and try to manually tune or optimize uh, uh, the uh, SDFGs for a different platform. And so with that, maybe I should talk about the uh, intermediate representation a bit in, in a bit more detail. So we base our intermediate representation on uh, concepts uh, from data flow programming from the late 70s and you know, the 80s, where basically if we have a computation like we have here, the x squared plus sine of x over pi, let's put it in a box. Okay, so in order to compute uh, this uh, expression, what we need is to get x from somewhere, and we denote the memory regions as circular uh, nodes here in this kind of graph, and we output y somewhere else. From this point on, we close this box. We call them tasklets. They can be at any granularity you want. So I mean, the obvious uh, uh, tendency is towards finer grained tasklets because they uh, are not allowed to have any kind of side effects. They just receive the information and pass on a different set of uh, information to the, to the other nodes. And uh, from this point on, we don't, they're completely opaque and we don't look into them for the entire purpose of the transformations. The memory movement units, so these small regions that we're passing, we call memlets. And so this is the basic kind of representation where we have a data flow where the nodes are, uh, you know, having data flowing between them through edges. Now, if you want to express parallelism in this representation, uh, let's say we can name these memory regions by putting names on the nodes themselves. You can see that parallelism expressed, uh, is expressed very natively. And it's very intuitive to say that two things that are uh, executed in parallel are actually parallel in the graph. But then there is a real problem also in other data flow representations is when we have really large graphs and even just multiplying two matrices of 200 by 200, this becomes infeasible to represent as a, as a um, explicit graph. And this becomes uh, obviously uh, impossible to represent for problems that we don't know the sizes in advance. So this graph that you see here becomes a parametric graph. And in order to, to deal with that, what we do is we use the fact that a lot of applications today are composed of repeating subunits of those uh, tasklets. And then we can basically group them into some scope as denoted here by this trapezoidal region, a parallel scope, uh, which is parametric, which we call a map scope. And within those two trapezoidal nodes, or more formally, the subgraph that is uh, dominated by the, this node here and post dominated by this node represents something that will be replicated for the amount of times that is uh, written in the integer set on this uh, node here. Now, as a programmer, um, you don't need to do a lot by just, uh, besides just defining that this is a parallel uh, scope and uh, when you specify a memlet like this, A at I, we have a symbolic math engine that we employ in the DACE framework that uh, propagates the axes through the map range. And then essentially this memlet here uh, is generated automatically. Now, why this is important? I mean, right now it doesn't seem too important because uh, it's, it's very clear what's being accessed. But sometimes as we see in other applications, uh, let's say we're manipulating a matrix, but we're only working on a single column of that, then it's very important to know that exactly we want to work on that column so that we don't copy extra data. Uh, for instance, if we're working on um, another, uh, let's say, coprocessor. So this is the basic of the uh, data flow itself. This is an acyclic uh, multigraph. But then there's another problem. So the other problem is, let's say we have these two graphs here in parallel, so they are one next to each other, the two connected components will run uh, uh, simultaneously. And so this now creates a, a data race that we want to resolve. So how can we say that, let's say the computation here on the left comes before the computation on the right? So we nest those acyclic uh, data flow graphs with another directed graph, which represents a state machine. And as you can see here, those uh, uh, blue edges here, they are uh, state transitions. So they have assignments and, and uh, conditions that they can have on top of them. And this acts exactly as a state machine. And so you can represent very concisely, for instance, loops as evident here by this uh, uh, solver that runs uh, some very simple stencil until 
uh, iteration capital T. And as you can see, most of this graph is parametric and symbolic. And these uh, T, H, and W can even be specified at runtime. And this graph can still be transformed, even though we don't know anything about uh, the actual sizes. So the representation itself is a language. And there is uh, you know, more to it than these four elements that we've seen so far, you know, the uh, states, tasklets, arrays, and maps. We also have, uh, for instance, nested control flow in data flow, so we can nest SDFGs within SDFGs. We have streams that act as uh, FIFO queues, and we have the counterpart of uh, maps to streams, so uh, and basically a scope that creates a producer-consumer relationship. And uh, what happens when we have more than one tasklet writing to the same uh, memory location, then we can define conflict resolution edges that uh, have an operation between them. So essentially covering all the read, modify, write atomics, but even more. Uh, so that's, and also lastly, the um, library nodes, which can interface with existing implementations so that if you have a really well optimized uh, intrinsic implementation, you can just uh, use that node instead. This also contributes to optimizing uh, very specific patterns in, in like domain specific transformations. And so overall, this is the entire representation, not much more to it. Uh, we can represent with it uh, many applications from many domains. And here we can see, for instance, a database uh, query. So we can see here how the data flows from A in parallel to some tasklet that maybe asks whether the value in A at I is uh, smaller than zero. And if so, uh, pushes it to the stream here. The stream is directly connected to another array. So uh, in essence, this would write it to the memory at B. And if, of course, this passes the filter, we want to know how many elements we filtered. So we have here an array of size one, B size, where we just write one to it within the test set. And then it gets, uh, with the conflict resolution, it becomes um, maybe an atomic operation or other operations depending on the target architecture. So we have full operational semantics in the supercomputing 19 paper. Uh, you can uh, take a look at that if you're interested. I'm going to go into that level of detail. Uh, but in general, this is a, a representation that can, you know, I represent a lot of applications in parametric graphs, but I didn't mention so far why it is useful for heterogeneity. So one of the main concepts that we can use this for now that we have uh, these parallel scopes is to introduce hierarchical parallelism, for instance. So we can put a map in a map, right? So we have a few more annotations on the nodes, uh, not just uh, the fact that they're a map, but also their schedule. So this is scheduled to a CPU multi-core. So that's basically an extensible enumeration. So you can implement your own uh, targets, your own schedulers. And the arrays here have storage locations. So we know that this uh, array is stored on, let's say, the CPU heap. And as you can see here, we specify some squaring operation in the task set. See the memory flowing here from, from A to the task set. And we can see that, well, depending on the size of TN, depending on the cache line size, uh, we won't necessarily have um, optimal performance when we work with such a tiny scheme. So one way to optimize this is to introduce a local array per core. Right? So in a standard application, I would add an array. Um, here in this graph representation, I can transform the graph by just adding an array in between. And as you can see, we can, we can really use the memlets to see the extents of the array, to see the addresses that are necessary to, um, uh, to go and, and copy the memory here, and even you know, offset the other addresses here going forward. So it's a really uh, easy way to manipulate code in, in terms of data flow without modifying the actual computation. The way we generate code from this is actually very straightforward. So here is, uh, let's say, a piece of the generated code that, that this graph represents. And if we have a CPU scheduler, we use uh, OpenMP to, to generate a loop. Uh, obviously, this could be implemented in any other uh, framework, but we chose OpenMP because it's really easy to use. The path of memlets going from A to TA is represented by another uh, operation. So here we have, uh, of course, a local memory definition and a very efficient copy operation. And we implement copies from different pairs of storage locations. And the internal map here, this, uh, this basically single core map, there is no parallelism in it. So we just implement it as a for loop. And the important thing to remember here is that we never change the task code. So the task that's here, we, we uh, convert them into C++ code and that's it. So this is uh, pretty much the end of the process for, for this task. And as I will show, 
this leads to very high performance in, in terms of uh, the resulting code after transformations. So it really doesn't matter uh, what the task that is. And so I think that this is one of the strengths of the uh, data centric uh, programming model. So now let's say instead of uh, CPUs, I want to run it on a GPU, right? So this would normally incur a complete rewrite of the code, you know, like having CUDA and uh, creating the kernel. And so for us, looking at this graph, all we have to do is to run another transformation. So actually this is an existing transformation in, in, in our framework written in Python. And this is called GPU transform. So essentially all it does is just adds an array here in between such that the uh, memory is on the GPU global memory. This of course incurs a copy on this edge here and uh, changes the, um, the map schedule here to GPU device. This one automatically changes to GPU thread block. So you can see exactly how this completely translates the code. This helps us to make uh, really drastic changes uh, in a very uh, easy way or easy uh, intuitive way. And so just to tell you this transformation, if I remember correctly, is written in 260 lines of Python code. So also it's very easy to write such transformations, um, which is another boost for productivity in, in my opinion. And so, uh, give a bit more detail about how we generate code to, to these load store architectures, CPUs, GPUs, and likes. Uh, we chose to generate, as you can see here, C++ code, or mostly C code. So we, we try to keep the code simple in terms of the generated code. And the reason why we chose that instead of, uh, let's say, uh, LVMIR is because uh, the uh, support for compilers on different architectures is much wider. So supporting Power9 CPUs, as we have for another application, was pretty much out of the box. You can support, you know, the IBM Excel compiler. We can support ICC, other compilers, CUDA, and we generate HIP code for AMD. So we also support the GPU and like both uh, GPU device types. And uh, in general, how we we generate the code from from these state machines is that we have uh, construct detections for for loops, for while loops, for branches, and in the worst case, we fall back to go tos, but that happens rarely. So. Uh, there's that. And we can exploit a lot of parallelism when we have these data flow graphs. So when we have a, obviously a map scope like you've seen before, then it can translate into an open MP scope. When we have conflict resolution, we use atomics, use uh, separate threads for the pr uh, consumer producer, producer consumer relationship. On GPUs, we can take the uh, separate components and actually run them as different GPU streams. And so as I shall show this, actually yields a, an interesting performance benefit, especially in more complicated applications where you have a lot of kernels happening all at the same time. And uh, when we have copies between different devices, whether it's CPU to GPU and or a collaborative copy between GPU global memory and GPU shared memory, this is all represented by the same construct, which is just a path of, of edges between one array node and another array node or one array node and a tasklet. And so a uh, simple representation that can cover a wide variety of, of patterns. And when we want to map to reconfigurable hardware like FPGAs, so this is something that would seem completely different. I mean, now we, we have to program circuits instead of a set of code. And uh, in that we actually generate uh, two different uh, uh, backends. So we support the, the both of the uh, big FPGA vendors. So we generate a high level synthesis uh, C++ for Xilinx and we generate um, OpenCL for Intel FPGAs. And uh, uh, the degree of, of things that we can exploit in reconfigurable hardware is the same, if not larger than what we can do with uh, CPUs and GPUs, the load store architectures. Basically, if we have parallelism, we can exploit spatial locality and you know, introduce replication. So what you see here on the right-hand side is a, a very concise representation of a systolic array where basically we have uh, a processing element, that processing element gets replicated p times, and now we can communicate through streams between the different uh, the, the different uh, parts of this uh, parts of the circuit. So we can see here how we read once from DRAM and then uh, uh, go through all of these processing elements and, and in, a, in a pipeline fashion. So this yields very high performance uh, as well on these uh, hardware architectures. And on the domain scientist side, so we have, as I said, a lot of uh, front ends, but the main front end that we, we use is Python. And so the programs, uh, they can integrate in existing Python code. So uh, similar to what uh, Numba does, we uh, put a decorator on top of a function. 
and you can work with uh, NumPy code. So we support a lot of NumPy, but not all of NumPy. And we, we don't support uh, list comprehensions and dictionaries and all the quirks of Python that you could use. But then we can, we can convert most of these codes into uh, STFGs. And uh, this is uh, something that you can then work with and transform further. So even if the original code was not really the best code, then we can keep working with that. And if you want to be very explicit about your data flow, we can even use this uh, bottom here uh, representation, which is just, a, let's say, a textual representation of, of the STFG. You can really see here how we have a program. We can, we can even combine the two. So you can have a map, and you can see exactly the memnets here coming in, coming out. This is a transposition operation. But you can see here how this is separate computations from the, from the data movement. And in the end, what we do is we, we compile an SO file uh, or just a, a library file for each platform. And uh, we also auto-generate an include file. So this can be linked from, uh, this has a C ABI, so you can link from it from, from Fortran or C. But if you run it from Python, we also load that library at runtime and we can invoke that function. So all in all, something that we can, can use uh, out of the box uh, and integrate into other programs. And so, uh, just to talk a bit more about transformations, let's say we wrote a matrix multiplication that, let's say for some uh, sizes of matrices, this is actually efficient. So this map reduce approach where we have uh, A and V here read and each pair of A, I, K and B, K, J is multiplied and stored into this three dimensional buffer, which is then flattened. So for very large uh, values of K and smaller M and Ns, this is actually something that, that might be useful. But in most cases, it is not. So as a performance engineer, you can see this and obviously say, oh, wait, you know, temp is not used anywhere else here. And there is a direct path here from this task that's going through temp and the reduction to C. So why not replace that with, uh, let's say, a bit more classical representation of matrix multiplication, which is, let's say, the, the three-dimensional loop with, um, uh, with the addition directly to C. So this is another data-centric transformation. And the way that the transformation looks, uh, so it's called map reduce fusion. And the way that it looks inside the, our, our code is uh, basically we look for a subref pattern. And this is something you define. So you define your subref, which is here like a, say a map exit node, an array, another uh, uh, reduction uh, library node. And then we have two more functions, one for, uh, let's say, uh, manual matching if you have your own condition. So you can write this in Python yourself. Uh, and uh, the replacement function, which just uses Graph API to you know, remove and add nodes uh, or edges or whatever as necessary. So uh, this constitutes a whole transformation. And what we do is we encourage also, you know, we have a set of 20 such, I think 20 something transformations built into the system as like a standard library of transformations. But we encourage performance engineers to write their own transformations and can apply them, you know, in a more uh, uh, programmatic uh, way for their own applications. I mean, if, if there are domain specific transformations to be applied. So in, in our paper, uh, we address more challenges. So for instance, what happens when we work with the sparse structures or what happens when we have the uh, nested state machines. So what I mentioned before with the nesting of SDFGs, I'm not going to go into that level of detail. What I am going to go into is uh, what it looks like for the performance engineer to work with such a representation. So as I said, we try to uh, work with or try to create a different workflow and in that workflow, we can obviously have the regular ID used for uh, the development of the front end, right? The, the high level code. But once we go into uh, performance engineer mode, we want to see the code, but also manipulate the graph. So we have a, a live view of a graph that we can uh, basically mutate and change directly. We can click a node. You can see here all the properties of that node or the edge, and you can modify them. You can see all the existing transformations. And you can see the generated code. So if you're interested to see what really uh, happens from, from that representation, you can, you can inspect it yourself. And those details that I mentioned before are saved as part of the STFG. So you see them as a history that you can undo, revert. And so this is a, a what's called diode. So a data-centric integrated optimization development environment for sh shorts, I guess, <laughs> diode. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, a work in progress, but also public. So we have uh, on the uh, Visual Studio Code store, uh, we have a plugin that we're working on for uh, VS Code well, within VS Code. So you can see here how we can inspect the graph uh, live and you can zoom in. And you can even, if you zoom in enough, you can see the actual code, you can jump to the source code directly, apply the transformation, see the history. 
And so we're really trying to understand uh, what would be the best kind of workflow uh, for both uh, roles to work in parallel. But this is uh, really something that is uh, open research at this point. And so as we apply those transformations, so let's say we take this matrix multiplication from before as an example, uh, you can see here, for instance, the uh, matrix multiplication that had the uh, reduced node and the big temporary buffer. So that doesn't even scale beyond 1024 cubed because of the uh, sheer size of, of that temp array. And you know, at some point, you just can't fit it in. But as we apply MapReduce Fusion, it's a bit faster. And you know, the memory footprint reduces drastically. And we can apply more and more transformations, some of them manual. Not every transformation is necessarily going to be better than the previous one. I mean, we cannot just apply a greedy approach to optimization. But this is why we try to promote this white box approach. I mean, we are aware that this is exactly what happens. As a performance engineer myself, you know, not every optimization you know, is going to make it faster, but it could be a stepping stone for a better transformation. And you can keep optimizing this. And basically, after six clicks of a button on the uh, diode interface, you can get to some uh, implementation that is actually 75% of, of Intel MKL. Which is not too bad for you know like a seven line Python code in six clicks, but this only uses the um, default parameters for the transformations. So for instance, tile sizes and such. Uh, if you auto tune the transformation parameters, you can actually get to 98.6% of MKL. And the only difference that we've observed between our implementation and MKL was uh, prefetching operations, which are also a data centric transformation that you know some people are welcome to implement. And so uh, even that final leg, we believe, can be made with, uh, with higher level code. So uh, we tried this uh, DACE framework on a variety of, of architectures. We tried multi-core CPUs. We tried the GPUs of various kinds. We tried the FPGAs. And we tried you know, this SDFG representation versus general purpose compilers and you know, polyhedral optimizers and even uh, the best of the best state of the art uh, frameworks and libraries. And when we try to compete with them. So we try to uh, look at fundamental computational kernels. So the matrix multiplication that we've seen before, but other like database query that we've also seen, histograms, stencils, and sparse matrix spectral multiplication. And in this uh, uh, plot here, you can see that uh, we're here on the left and lower is better. You can see that obviously this 98.6% of MKL is something we attain. Uh, we can observe and, and find more transformations that the other compilers, including ICC, cannot find in query. And this is thanks to uh, this data-centric representation that can also see things like uh, the FIFO queues as a um, first-class citizen of the representation. And we see similar results in all of the uh, other uh, programs. And especially in sparse matrix vector multiplication, we can see that basically our representation is on par with MKL getting the same performance. And we see a similar picture with the GPUs and FPGAs, where we get uh, here um, 90% of uh, Cutlass. Cutlass is uh, like a Kubla, so it's a linear algebra library, but written within CUDA. So we consider this, uh, because this is written by NVIDIA, we consider this to be the, uh, let's say, uh, best attainable performance on GPUs for matrix multiplication. And our performance ranges between, I think it was 90% and 105% of Cutlass, depending on you know sizes and parameters. So you can attain pretty much the same performance. But even if we get 90%, I mean, for some cases, uh, this is uh, exactly what you need because we have full control over the representation. For FPGAs, the performance is even better. So we have uh, a really good performance even compared with uh, languages that are meant to work with FPGAs, like Spatial, for instance, where we're 20 times faster in matrix multiplication. Uh, but really what you can see here is compared with, um, with high-level synthesis, uh, which is just standard C code, we consistently outperform uh, those kind of representations, which again, this representation was designed with data flow and um, state machines in mind. So it is already a much more uh, promising, uh, let's say, basic representation to work with uh, uh, reprogrammable circuits. And just to show you what the fully optimized uh, matrix multiplication application looks like. So if we really want to see, like, the, the, this is the GPU matrix multiplication, if I could zoom in, I hope this works. We can really see how A is copied to the GPU. We can see a tile size here. Uh, we apply the transformation called the double buffering, which can read uh, from the global memory to the shared memory while processing uh, on you know, another slice of the shared memory. So all in all, I mean, this is just a couple of transformations, not too deep of a, of a search, uh, let's say, space. And the task here is still 
C equals A times B, the uh, conflict resolution edge here is still addition. Nothing changed from, from the previous representation that you saw before, but still this is a very flexible representation that you can, let's say, put more computations into or do other things and um, completely open. And so we were still not convinced, so we looked at other applications. So this is a, a benchmark for polyhedral applications called Polybench. It has 30 applications. Here we try to see what happens when we don't perform any kind of transformations, just to see the power of the representation itself. And we see that uh, in most cases, we are on par with the polyhedral compilers, not in all cases, but that's fine. There were no transformations involved. But in GPUs the, uh, and FPGAs, the performance is also uh, more interesting because when we compare this uh, representation with PPCG, which is a tool that is uh, specifically designed to take polyhedral uh, CPU code and turn it into GPU code, our GPU transform uh, transformation, the one that I mentioned before, can sometimes achieve up to uh, 12 times performance speed up over the uh, other implementation. And the reason why is what I mentioned in the beginning, the fact that we have a symbolic math engine and the fact that we know when to copy and what exactly to copy uh, is the reason why we can we can gain uh, more performance. And if you look at the FPGA part, I mean, you can see that um, oddly enough, there are no other bars but ours. Uh, but this is intended, so uh, no worries. Uh, the reason because uh, the reason why is that this was the first time that someone was able to uh, synthesize, place and route, and even run to completion without hanging the uh, uh, the entire Polybench. Uh, uh, data set on uh, on FPGAs. So again, we, we seem to think that this is a, a very promising approach for handling all the different kind of architectures uh, without, um, you know, changing the code too much. And so we were still not convinced that so we tried, you know, a bit more complicated applications. So we, uh, one other kernel that we tried was a breadth first search. So this is a completely irregular application. We compared here with the state of the art libraries, Galois and Gluon for CPUs, Gunrock and Grout for GPUs. And what we can see here is uh, that when we try different kinds of graphs, we tried uh, roadmaps, social networks, and synthetic power law graphs, uh, we are with the CPU on par and sometimes a bit faster uh, than uh, these other implementations, which were manually optimized for like, nearly a decade. And for uh, GPUs, we also see that we can, um, depending on the graph type and depending on the transformation scheme, we can outperform the state of the art libraries in all of those cases. And uh, just to show you a bit about the CPU uh, representation. So what you see here is the fully transformed uh, CPU graph. And in my opinion, I think that you can apply more transformations. So only three transformations were applied here. So with more transformations for other uh, graph types, I think we can uh, reach the same performance or higher than the other libraries. And you can see that it's still uh, more or less legible. I mean, we, we applied here map tiling and a few uh, accumulation transformations. Uh, but all in all, I would say that this is a pretty promising approach that changes the uh, uh, workflow from the beginning uh, and uh, has this uh, intermediate representation that is based on concepts from data flow. It can apply to a wide variety of applications. So uh, there are more applications that I'm not showing here. Um, for instance, we have uh, applications in deep learning, in numerical weather prediction, and in uh, quantum transport simulation, which I actually have a bit of time, so I'll show. And in all of those applications, we can achieve state-of-the-art performance with this representation. So all in all, I think that this is a very promising approach. And since it's fully written in Python and generates C code and compiles with CMake, uh, we can just pip install this uh, base uh, project. It installs uh, all the dependencies on its own, and you know, just uh, you know, you can you can try it and download it and let us know what you think. And so, if I yeah, I think I have a few more minutes. I can talk about uh, a bit about this uh, application. So, uh, the quantum transport simulation in uh, Omen is uh, an application that uh, is uh, just uh, won the uh, 2019 ACM Gordon Bell Prize. Uh, basically, what it does is it tries to measure how transistors heat up in a processor. And because uh, this is a very small scale process, then we have to uh, work with a quantum simulation. So basically, we're heating up a lot of transistors in order to find out how transistors heat up. So uh, this is uh, something that, that we've been doing. So this is a, a, a well-known code base with previous papers. 
and it has um, like it's a simulation that runs in loop. And this is one of those uh, parts in, in that simulation. And uh, this Omen application was uh, optimized. Uh, it was uh, it had papers before about how to optimize that, and it was worked on for years. And what they chose to do is in, in one of those um, one of those bigger parts is that uh, they the the original domain scientists uh, chose to tile the loop structure in the sense that uh, mapping this to the distributed computation in a way that takes the uh, first and biggest dimensions and, and tries to separate them. And they even ran further transformations about you know how to work with um, how to work with the same uh, node and try to you know minimize um, intranode communication, internode communication, really uh, work well on the optimization. So all in all, this is a 90,000 line of code, C++ and CUDA uh, uh, library. So very, very large uh, code base. And they optimized even the MPI collective calls and try to minimize the peer-to-peer -peer mo uh, movement. But all in all, um, you see here that the whole memory movement volume is multiplicative in a lot of factors. There are a lot of MPI invocations. Some of them are actually based on the sizes of the problem. And Alex, who is uh, the uh, PhD student who led this paper, uh, when, when they saw the SDFG representation of the same uh, simulation, he immediately saw that something here is not as optimal as it can be. So when you tile with these two dimensions, you can actually see that the five-dimensional and six-dimensional tensors are actually moved uh, between or across all of the nodes for every iteration, which can be very costly. And so we decided to collapse. Uh, Sal, sorry to yes. interrupt you. It would be good to leave some time for, for questions. Mm -hmm. and we are OK, sure. Yeah, I'm almost done. I would just, uh, no worries. So this is, I think, the next to last slide. Anyway, so he decided to completely change basically the structure of the, of the application by just tiling it with a different dimension, which is something that you cannot do with this original source code. This would entail a rewrite of, of the whole MPI code. And basically, he reduced all these factors from multiplicative to additive and the number of implications see more information about this in the paper. And also the same optimizations that we've been doing on the, on the large scale, we've been doing on, a on the lower scale. So um, here with a very particular set of computations, we see how we apply a set of transformations and we can even outperform uh, Kublas on, on these uh, GPUs by a factor of five. All in all, a very interesting application. And what I mentioned before about concurrent execution. So here you see a picture of, of a sub computation of this. And you can see that basically the way that we natively um, output to different streams can increase the concurrency. As you can see, a complete overlap of data movement and computation. We can see that the scalability, the scaling efficiency on both the Pitsdynt and Summit supercomputers were really good, up to the point where we had uh, 27,000 uh, GPUs running at 60% uh, of, of peak performance. So again, a very uh, interesting representation. And yeah, so thank you for your time. Uh, we are open for collaborations. We have uh, open PhD and postdoc positions. So go to this website if you're interested. And yeah, now we have time for questions. Sorry. So thank you, Tal, for this very interesting talk and impressive results. And also very nice uh, to see that even though you say that uh, you were addressing uh, data traffic uh, as a main overhead source, you can get uh, improvements uh, even also for compute bound operations such as the matrix matrix multiplication. So uh, we have time for a couple of questions, probably. So there's a first question already posted. Is how are MPI and MPI plus X execution modes handled in your approach? Yes, OK, so I'll answer this quickly. So MPI is one of the schedules that we can annotate uh, maps. So as you saw in the uh, Omen application. So this is still a work in progress. We're working on, on more uh, interesting ways to, to infer uh, communication. Uh, this is uh, far from, from trivial, but for uh, some uh, computations, you can just apply, uh, you, can, you can set the schedule of the map to MPI and this generates the right code. Okay, thank you. So let's see if there is any other question. In the meantime, I can ask you one of my, uh, one of my questions, for example, is how does your, your approach relate to other uh, runtime-based uh, approaches for distributed computing, like for example, OMS from Barcelona Supercomputing Center even though it is not exactly this with the memory, but for example, start PU from INRIA or Parsec from University of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So uh, the main difference I would say is that this, uh, this framework is uh, generating code instead of a runtime that invokes and schedules tasks at runtime. So 
once we have those graphs, we can, uh, for instance, uh, statically schedule uh, very interesting patterns like uh, those streams in advance. We can uh, make sure that we allocate the memory also in advance. So we have a lot of optimizations that we can apply. And because we generate code, we can go all the way down to the, uh, to the actual implementation. And yeah, so I would say this is the main difference between these two approaches. Okay. Mm -hmm. so let's see if there are more questions. I don't see anybody writing anything right now. So I also saw that the uh, heterogeneity is uh, handled in your approach by uh, this hierarchical uh, mapping of the uh, code to the resources. Is there anything else that you have to change in your programming languages to address heterogeneity specifically? So there are two main things that you change, which is the schedule of the maps and the storage location of the of the arrays or streams. Okay. Yeah. You can also annotate a specific subgraph to say, I want this to run on a specific device. So you don't necessarily have to have a map to run some code on a GPU. You can run a test that on its own. But yeah, so this is the same schedule. So it's the same parameter that you change. Okay, thank you again. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Tal, uh, I understand that you tested your tool within your lab so far, right? Uh, do you have any uh, experience of this tool used by somebody else outside your lab? Yes, so at this point, I'm not sure how much I can talk about it. So first of all, this Omen application is not uh, something that is uh, by our lab. It's another lab at uh, ETH Zurich. And we have now other users that are currently uh, working uh, with this, some of them uh, use their own domain specific languages and just convert that into our uh, representation. And we have run this on uh, different clusters with different platforms. Uh, so for instance, with Omen here, we run it on Summit, which we run on uh, Power9 CPUs and also got state of the art performance. So yeah, so we tried this also outside of the lab and we have existing collaborations, yes. And uh, who is supposed to be a user? So do, do you have to be a performance engineer or a domain uh, scientist? Or who, 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 is, who, is, who is supposed to benefit? Because it looks like you need a lot of knowledge to use it, right? So is any tool. Uh, so it's not for, for uh, dummies, obviously, it's for somebody. So how can you describe who is the ideal user of your tool? Okay, so it really depends. So I think maybe the ideal tool, the ideal user is, uh, uh, let's say, a team that uh, may comprise both. But you know, sometimes a domain scientist is also a kind of a performance engineer. Uh, what would happen is if you write a piece of code and just uh, attach a DACE uh, program there on, on top of that function. So this is uh, this could be any, uh, let's say, NumPy code that you just uh, convert into high performance code. So even without too many transformations, you can you can see some performance benefits. So I uh, can see some end users just using Python to, to improve the performance there. And especially when we work with the deep learning frameworks, all you have to do is change one line of your code and now suddenly you're using uh, DACE instead. Uh, but if you really want to squeeze the most performance out of, your, um, out of your code, I would say that you need to have a representation like an SDFG of your program and then have a performance engineer work on that. Uh, last so that was the other last question, uh, Enrique, sorry about that. Uh, last question. So if you use your tool to develop to optimize application and the target platform is so expensive and, and big, so you still have to run it to see the result or how, how does it? So in the representation, system? so if you hover over the, uh, the actual representation, we have also programmatic tools. So one of the things that we, we actually do when we apply, uh, let's say more programmatic automated transformations, we can we can traverse the graph and we can see in the memlets the data movement volume and the uh, surface or the accesses exactly with kind of what kind of subsets we're going to access. And so you can run a very crude performance model. Uh, so instead you, of just you, you, you have a performance model actually. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we cannot model the tasklets themselves because they are computations that we don't look into, but uh, the data movement itself definitely is modeled and, and we're using that. Mm -hmm. The last question, because I, I saw this question on, on Slack. Is there any way, any way to use this uh, tool for C++ codes? It's an interesting question, a question that we're currently researching. So it's, it's a very 
a tough thing to to convert uh, from from C and C++ to to something that that is more workable. We need to extract the underlying parallelism. We need to uh, get the the SDFG from that. But it's something we're actively working on. So uh, stay uh, posted, and uh, if if you're interested, uh, we can even collaborate. So this is a truly an interesting undergoing uh, ongoing project. Okay. So thank you for all the questions. Thank you to all again for your talk and virtual applause to you. <laughs> and then we can move to the next uh, uh, presentation. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay. So the speaker for the next uh, uh, talk can uh, share his uh, screen. We can uh, uh, start right away. Uh, can you see my screen already? Yes. Okay, so uh, my name is Pavel Koperek. Uh, I would like to present uh, our work on applying the reinforcement learning approach uh, to uh, cloud resources management, especially uh, our recent research focused on applying the policy gradient optimization methods, uh, in, in particular the proximal policy optimization to a system which leverages heterogeneous cloud resources. And I would first like to explain um, the motivation behind our research, the problem uh, we attempt to solve. And then I would like to discuss uh, related work, describe the system which was created to evaluate the policies and uh, describe how we conduct the training of the policy. And next, uh, I'll briefly explain the setup of the experiment we conducted and present some results. And finally, I would like to provide some conclusions and outline the plans for further work. So there are two major reasons of our research in this space. So first of all, uh, we, we made an observation that the cloud environments have um, many features which are uh, often desired when working with reinforcement learning algorithms. And in particular, we can notice that the, the, the behavior of applications which are deployed to clouds uh, can be considered deterministic. They can be very complex, sometimes look almost like random behavior. However, underneath we know that they are governed by a set of well-defined rules. At the end of the day, they are just uh, being calculated on, on CPUs. And this means that such environments can be simulated and this is a great advantage. Furthermore, in those environments, uh, we can easily observe a number of uh, metrics, measurements, and they can be gathered on a fine grain level. And implementing the interaction between the agent and the environment can be also easily achieved by leveraging the cloud vendor APIs. And the, the, the agent, the decision pool itself, can, re, can be relatively easily plugged into the management or monitoring software. And probably uh, the biggest advantage is actually that defining a cost function, something we can use to um, to understand whether our policy is, uh, is training in the right direction is relatively easy. So we know what would be the cost of using the cloud resources because the vendor provides us with a pricing model and we know what kind of SLAs we agreed to. So we can, uh, we can easily determine what would be penalties in any, any specific situation. And the second reason for our interest in this space is that in general, the, the automation in the cloud management domain is, is not a new concept. There are already tools which uh, exist and they, they help with automating steps which are um, quite often repeatable. And however, most of that software, it usually relies on some form of expert knowledge. So I think the simplest example is just setting thresholds for actions uh, for scaling actions in, in the cloud vendors interfaces and, and doing so and making sure that uh, the whole platform, the application uh, is, uh, is still stable and doesn't, uh, doesn't fall into some catastrophic state requires uh, careful tuning and, and um, including all of the details and intricacies of the managed application in those thresholds. So if we could make it more generic and um, easier to set up, like many applications could probably benefit from that approach. On the other hand, in, in recent years, we can observe that there was a lot of success in applying reinforcement learning to many complex domains, especially give, if, if we think through the lens of deep reinforcement learning, there are many established state of, uh, state of the art results um, on tasks like um, 
achieving superhuman performance in complex strategy games or robot control or mastering the game of Go, which is, which is considered to be very complex. And given, given all of that, uh, we can see that uh, if only we would be able to uh, leverage uh, such, such, uh, such, such an approach, uh, we, could, we could render many benefits. Uh, to name maybe the, the, the first obvious ones, we can have uh, just simply uh, lower monetary costs of running the resources and we can have higher resource utilization. But also probably uh, most interestingly from our point of view, because the system, uh, the, the management system, quote unquote, understands the true objective, our true objective in running the application, it also understands the level of the quality of service which we want to provide. So uh, even though the, the, the management policy would try to introduce changes that uh, would reduce the, the number of resources, we could expect that it would, uh, like our expectation would be that it would never introduce changes, which would result in lowering those standards of, uh, of, of service. And research objective, on our, on our side was twofold. First, we wanted to evaluate whether uh, using meth methods such as uh, proximal policy optimization uh, is, um, is, is it a valid approach and if there are, if there are any fundamental issues which, would, which should prevent us from using them in, in general. And the secondary objective was to compare uh, such a, like so to compare a policy which was created using uh, with this training algorithm to a sample, uh, threshold-based policy, and this should uh, enable us to assess whether such a policy is, for example, significantly worse or is comparable with, with such a standard approach. Uh, let me try to quickly define reinforcement learning in more detail. Uh, in general, this is a research area which explores how software agents can interact with some environment and uh, by interactions, we understand here taking some actions or making observations. And in general, the goal of the agent is to maximize some form of reward. And that reward, that reward is usually specified through some kind of a function. Uh, and the function usually uses the, the state of the system and possibly the actions of the agent to determine the current reward. And usually in context of reinforcement learning, we also talk about learning algorithms and their goal on the other, on the other side is to uh, create or find the optimal policy and basically to figure out how to make the decisions, which actions needs to be taken in order to maximize the reward we just defined. And in the, in the space of uh, automated cloud provisioning and uh, automated cloud management, one quite popular approach uh, is the deep queue learning. And uh, it, there was a certain amount of success in, in, in applying the technique. However, the recent research suggests that there are um, approaches which might render better experimental results, in particular, the policy optimization methods. And those, those methods of training are considered a little bit more stable in training. So, uh, we can say that like, by stability, we understand the higher chance to reach, uh, to converge to a policy which behaves well in the, in the environment and, and in reaching the goal we set it to, to achieve. Uh, and it's mostly attributed to the fact that those methods directly optimize the policy itself. So they are based on stochastic gradient descent, uh, which optimizes the parameters, in this case, the weights of a neural network, which is the policy itself. Uh, in more advanced versions, uh, we maybe simple is not the right word, but we simply add constraints to the performance objective. Uh, those constraints uh, are sometimes expressed as uh, changes in the probability of certain changes, or uh, in our case, we use, uh, we use a method which simply defines the constraint, this additional constraint as just limiting the size of the step, which is taken by, by the optimizer. And that uh, that, that limitation is, can be expressed as a predefined factor. And sometimes it's referred to as a clipping factor. Uh, let's have a brief look at the system we, we use to evaluate uh, the, the, the policy. 
from a high level perspective, uh, it creates a feedback loop which, uh, in which the policy interacts with the environment under management. And the loop starts with collecting some measurements about the resources which are taking part in executing the workload. And uh, those can be completely different, different types of, uh, of resources depending on the, on, on the actual application on the, or, on the, or the actual environment. And in our case, those were simply virtual machines and the, the piece of software which was generating the workload, so the, the workload driver. The measurements uh, which are generated by those, uh, by those entities can differ in, for example, how often their values are provided. Uh, so for example, like the, the amount of RAM and CPU can be reported, let's say every 10 seconds, while the count of virtual machines may be collected, let's say once per minute. And in order to simplify all of, the, all of those collection needs, we introduce graphite. And the graphite simply aggregates the, col the collected values and it creates a, a snapshot, which is a consistent view of all of the measurements we have in the environment. Uh, such a snapshot is then pushed to SAM, a component which is uh, calculating the values of the metrics, which are used to determine the current state of the environment. And such state of the such a snapshot of the state of the environment can be later passed to the policy evaluation service which is probably the most interesting part of that system because it actually embeds the decision policy and the policy evaluation service provides the decisions on how to change the allocation of resources and it does it by uh, basically feeding the state of the environment by translating the state of the environment to the format which is understandable by the neural network, which is our policy. And then the output of the neural network is used as an indication of what action should be executed. And such an action might include adding or removing a virtual machine of a certain size, or simply skipping, skipping execution of an action at all. And after a decision is made, Sam implements it by executing functions from the uh, Cloud Vendors API. Uh, the cloud evaluation, the, sorry, the policy evaluation service requires a policy, uh, of course, which needs to go through a training process. So in our case, this training process is simply training the policy with use of the uh, proximal policy optimization algorithm. And to avoid a high cost of, of executing such training in the real environment, we have decided to use a simulation. And the main process uh, of the simulation uses the Cloud Sim Plus framework. And that process is wrapped with a OpenAI gym type interface. And this helps to decouple it from other components of the system. Uh, thanks to that, we're able to quite easily test out other algorithms or uh, check if, uh, if like how, how, the, how a specific model or how a specific policy would behave in a different experimental setup. And one important feature of our simulator is that we're able to adjust the time flow. So it could be slowed down or uh, more importantly, speeded up. And that in particular helps a lot in shortening the training time. And for example, in, in our experiments, we chose to speed up the flow of time 60 times. So one iteration of simulation would correspond to 60 seconds in the real world time. And the simulation hosts an independent data center, which provides a limited number of resources. And those resources uh, can have a predefined, uh, can, can, can be pretty much of, uh, of any kind of type and capacity. It's kind of up to the uh, simulation creator to decide what kind of resources are available. In our case, we just split, uh, split the available resources into three types of virtual machines. Uh, small, which had two cores, medium, which had four cores, and large, which had eight, eight cores. Uh, such a configuration corresponds to our live setup where we utilized M5 large, X large, and 2X large virtual machines from AWS. And uh, one, one interesting factor here is, uh, is that the presented setup can be easily extended to support also other types of machines or architectures because the, the policy itself simply discovers their features by, uh, by the way they interact with the environment. So, from the point of view of the policy, we don't need to provide any specific details of uh, what kind of resources we want to use in, in our environment. We simply include it in our simulation. 
We experimented also with a few different training workloads. Uh, however, we, we settled on a synthetic one. Uh, and that, that workload in particular was uh, similar to, the, to a typical workload which was generated by our test application. And one, uh, one uh, quite crucial element of our training process is the reward function. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, like this is one of the biggest advantages of, of uh, working with the cloud environment domain because we can, uh, our, our reward function is simply a combination of the uh, public cloud vendor uh, cost and then ex we extend it with, uh, with the estimation or with the formulation of how much uh, SLA penalties we would pay if in, in case any, um, any error situation occurs. So in our case, we, we simply include the time spent by machines of different type, multiplied by their individual cost. And then at the end, we include the penalties which we, need to, uh, which we agreed to pay in case a task, a computational task is being submitted to the processing queue. However, it's not being processed. So we basically pay a fixed fee for every second of uh, wait time for, for all the tasks we're sending to the system. And on one side, this should encourage system to, uh, th this gives the visibility to the policy uh, to, uh, to sh it shows it how, how, how big are the costs of running the infrastructure. So it creates a pressure uh, to reduce the, the amount of resources used to conduct the computations. And on the other hand, we have a pressure uh, from the other side to maintain a certain amount of resources in order to avoid those uh, SLA penalties. Uh, in, in, in our environment, we focus mostly on CPU and RAM resources. Uh, we ignore basically all other factors. However, it is uh, uh, using a different set of metrics is relatively easy. We just need to include their, sorry, include their definitions in, in the simulation. And then obviously in the, in the live environment. And such a focus on CPU and RAM resources is visible through the uh, through the set of metrics we, we, we calculate to express the state of the system. And first of all, we track the ratio of allocated resources. So we know whether the, the system is at its, uh, it's at its capacity or we still have room to, to grow. And we track the average CPU utilization and RAM and also the ratio of jobs submitted for processing uh, to the jobs submitted either within uh, the latest monitored uh, quant of time or within the whole, uh, within the whole uh, training process. And finally, uh, we, we apply, like we combined all of those elements with the proximal policy optimization training algorithm. And you can see um, at the chart that uh, it, it did a good, uh, a good job on actually reaching the, um, actually like reaching the, 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 the local or global uh, minimum of the maximum of the function. So in our formulation, we want to maximize the function. So the cost function, be, uh, negative cost function became the reward function. And you can see that at the very beginning, uh, we had like huge values, which means that the policy was trying out to use uh, all of the resources uh, possible. But then gradually it started growing. There were uh, a few ups and downs, but eventually we plateaued on, on, on values which are close to zero. And uh, finally, after, after training a policy, we wanted to uh, evaluate it in a live environment. And for that, we designed uh, our experiment. And in general, we wanted to check if the automated control of uh, a set of heterogeneous resources can be uh, used to host a sample scientific application, which is deployed to a public, publicly managed cloud environment. So our, uh, as, as our workload, we chose uh, a tool called PyTorch DNN Evolution, which is a tool which, which helps to discover uh, an optimal structure of the deep neural network to solve a given problem, a supervised learning problem using a means of evolution. And evaluate like in, in, in such a form in, in such a so, so in such a tool uh, since we're evaluating a lot of uh, individuals um, such uh, every single evaluation 
includes training a specific neural network on a small subset of the original data set. And um, if we consider uh, such an individual job in context of the whole, uh, of the whole um, process, it's relatively small and independent from the other ones. And it can be easily parallelized and rescheduled in case of a failure, or more importantly, in case of a scaling down event. So we can, um, we can easily reschedule the tasks and obtain the uh, same end value result and this uh, this makes the tool kind of perfect for uh, for for our experiments. Unfortunately, the downside of such workflow formulation is that it's not uniform in time, and the number of evaluation changes between evolution iterations because we never know how many new individuals will need to be evaluated in every iteration. And furthermore, every evaluation takes a slightly different amount of time just because the, the architecture of the, of the neural network, which we're evaluating, uh, is probably slightly different or very different from the other ones. And this means that this package could actually greatly benefit from using autonomous scaling because it would dramatically lower the cost of, of, of running the uh, evolutionary experiments. And in our experiment as the public uh, cloud environment, we chose to use uh, Amazon Web Services uh, Compute Cloud. And uh, similarly to the environment which I described um, in, in context of the simulation, we use three groups of virtual machines. Uh, those are the M5 large, X large, and 2X large machine types. Uh, they basically just differ in the amount of resources provided, and they have uh, like ev ev every type of machine who, with growing re resources have growing costs. So for the first one, we pay 20 cents, for the next 40, for the last 180. And the uh, amount of the available resources was capped. Uh, we didn't want to, to get the environment to become too large. And uh, as such, we, we capped it at 10 virtual machines of each type. And we ran the evolutionary algorithm twice. So the first time we used, uh, we managed the resources automatically with use of the policy trained with PPO. And the second time we use a rule-based policy which, uh, which can be set independently for every auto-scanning group. And unfortunately, uh, this creates um, a pretty significant difference between those policies. So we're, we're not entirely comparing apples to apples in terms of the uh, performance comparison because uh, the threshold-based policy, since it's set on the auto scanning group level, so on the level of a single virtual machine type. Uh, since it's being set up in such a way, it's uh, possible for that, for the type of policy to issue basically three actions in every monitoring iteration, whereas our, our policy would be able to run just one, one action. So for example, provision one virtual machine. So to kind of even out the playing field, we decided to change the, to adjust the Cool down period of time. Uh, a cool down period is, 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 the, is the time when the agent can't interact with the environment because we assume that, uh, for example, running starting a virtual machine will take some, some additional time for setting up and connecting to the rest of the cluster. So we set it up to one minute on, for our policy and for three minutes to the threshold based policy. And on average, this means that both approaches were able to provision the same or similar amount of resources. Uh, so the, the overall results of the experiment are, are as follows. So the PPO trained policy took 173 minutes with the cost of resources uh, equal to $8.67 and respectively the threshold based policy run the same uh, evolutionary experiment within 149 minutes and uh, the cost of used resources was equal to nine dollars ninety five cents, and if we uh, like, obviously the threshold based policy was able to complete the task faster. However, if you look through the lens of the uh, the actual goal, which was to minimize the, the 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 cost of running resources, then PPO trained policy renders slightly better results. So it traded the additional processing time for lowering the, the overall cost of, of used resources. And on the charts, you can see like how, uh, how the, the counts of the machines of different types were changing during the course of the experiment. 
So in case of the threshold based policy, we see that uh, it was more uh, quote unquote eager to add resources because of uh, uh, because it was able to launch those uh, three uh, different types of machines in the same type. However, as soon as the processing load started to decrease, then it started to reduce only the amount of large VMs. And then like it plateaued at some time and at the end of the simulation, it was able to shut down everything. On the other hand, the PPO train policy uh, like established some level of uh, resources of each type. So you can see that the large VMs, the count of large VMs remained stable pretty much through the course of the full evolutionary simulation. Uh, medium ones were changing only slightly, and but the small ones, they were being uh, dropped and restarted quite quickly. And those drops uh, correspond to simply starting a new iteration of evolution. So whenever there was like a moment of silence in, in issuing new tasks, like then the algorithm tried to reduce the, um, the amount of resources which were used. And again, we acknowledge that this is not fully apples to apples comparison because of the mentioned differences. However, uh, this experiment shows that uh, by using uh, a policy which was effectively starting from no knowledge about the environment to the point where it's able to uh, manage the resources of different types uh, for uh, an actual application, uh, it shows that the, the, those results are on par. Um, so to conclude, um, we were able to use a policy uh, optimization method to create, to create an autonomous agent, and that agent was capable of managing a cloud, like a, a, a set of heterogeneous resources, which were used to back uh, a scientific application. And using the simulator allowed us to increase the speed of the simulation and lower the cost of the training. And actually, uh, it, it also allowed us to launch many more uh, iterations over the uh, many more iterations of uh, uh, during the simulation and this helped greatly to improve the quality of the policy and however such uh, su su such uh, such policy even though it has uh, some advantages there are also some disadvantages unfortunately so we noticed that for example our resource allocation policy wasn't able to react to changes in the environment fast enough uh, it was capable only of starting and stopping a single virtual machine at a time. And this is, this is a structural problem. And in kind of in line with our expectations, it seemed that the policy was able to make good decisions in the situations it was able to train for uh, in the prior training. However, uh, in a situation which, which was relatively new, for example, the uh, the shutdown of the whole system. It wasn't shutting out the resources as fast as the threshold one. And actually, I, probably the biggest issue of, of this approach is that the behavior of the agent is quite hard to explain. So we can only see the weights of the neural network which is used as the policy. And if we want to reason about how a certain decision was made, we need to uh, analyze how those weights affect uh, this, how weights and state of the system, the, the metrics we, we used to describe the state of the system uh, work together to produce a certain result. And the policy also is tied to the metrics or and the, the description of the environment which we have specified. So if we would like to extend the system, this would again require to retrain the policy to a uh, set of uh, new metrics. And we plan to uh, continue the approach uh, which we which we discussed here, and there are three main areas of work. Uh, first one being adding uh, an improvement loop, which would allow to dynamically adjust the policy while the workload changes. And this would probably remove the requirement of training the policy prior to the deployment. And secondly, uh, as mentioned already in the in the in the conclusions. Uh, if we would like to make the policy be able to react faster to the changes in the environment, we need to extend the range of available actions and we need to enable the system to add or remove, the, remove more than one resource in a single action. And finally, uh, we notice that in general, there might be a lot of um, like deploying the, the, the policy in such, in such shape 
uh, to production environment may be considered quite risky, uh, exactly because uh, explaining why the policy makes certain decisions is not a straightforward task to do. So we think that providing output from, from, such, a, from such a management system as a form of recommendation or suggestion to a human operator might be a good starting point uh, to, to drive some adoption. Um, and this, is, this concludes uh, my presentation. We prepared a list of references if anyone is interested in following up on the, on the topics I, I have mentioned. I would like to uh, thank you for, for your attention and I believe we, we still have some time to answer some questions. So thank you, Pavel. So as uh, Pavel invited you, are there any questions for this talk? A question about your experiments while people is uh, think about their own uh, questions is in your simulation training environment uh, is the uh, how do you uh, schedule the arrival of the jobs to the system is that something that is uh, included in the cloud sim simulator or is something that you configure um you mean the definition of the workload or uh, the robot the arrival times of the of the jobs is that something that is uh, you assume that all the jobs are already uh, in the in the in the queue um, so uh, no like we, like the simulation um uh, basically we we have like a, a definition of the workload however the definition doesn't include the time uh, of how for how long a certain task should be executed we actually have a uh, like our description actually includes uh, the number of uh, instructions, so you can think of it as um, like if, if you if you measure an existing workload uh, by looking at how much time did it take to compute it on a certain processor, you can uh, you can check what is the let's say you can benchmark how many millions of operations per second it can execute, and then you can multiply that factor by the time you uh, you need to uh, to uh, conclude the, the the calculation. And in such a way, you get a description of a job which can be translated between different types of machines. So this way, we were able to have an environment where uh, a workload definition can be applied to environment which is completely fluid. So you can have an environment where we only have, for example, the small machines, and then the calculation takes a little bit longer. Or you can have an environment where you have like only the large machines with fast, pro with fast CPUs, and then the processing tech takes uh, much less time. Okay, great, thank you. And the related question that they have about your experiment is that uh, are all your jobs single node jobs or uh, because you don't take into account, it seems that you don't take into account what is the communication cost. Mm -hmm. So, so in case, you assume that it is trivial communication or you cannot consider that uh, or uh, that's that there is no communication. Mm -hmm. So uh, at least in, in, our, in the case of our experiment, just because uh, our, uh, I mean, our sample application actually works in such a way that the parallelism is trivial because uh, we launch a lot of independent uh, training processes. And because every single process has their own, like has its own uh, small data set and it's uh, maybe not small, but its own neural network model, uh, such a piece of calculation is independent. So we can, uh, we can say that, okay, like we have uh, like every single task which we run uh, can be potentially scheduled to any type of the machine, but it's uh, like we don't have to communicate between tasks. Like uh, on, on, the, on the low level, we don't have to communicate with the tasks. However, the evolutionary process itself it synchronizes those jobs uh, to some degree because I, I even let me, let me get to that slide. Uh, if you look at the uh, like how the number of jobs in the in the processing queue looks like, you can see those spikes. So this is this is just how the evolution works. So you can see that like there are points of synchronization where the evolution basically gathers all the, all of the results. Um, takes into consideration the fitness of the individuals and then issues another batch of jobs. So the, the, the basic kind of units of calculation, which are kind of problematic to manage because they are, they are so different and there are so many differences in, in their numbers. Um, they are independent. However, the, I mean, the, general, the general calculation of the evolution includes the communication at the driver level. Okay. Thank uh, you maybe, to, for, maybe, for maybe to add to this, uh, in general, our simulator doesn't um, 
doesn't prevent uh, of modeling any communication between those independent tasks. So I guess that if, 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 if one chooses to uh, use that approach to, to have an autonomous agent which, which manages an architecture which has those communicating uh, tasks, then yes, it's like it can be expressed within such a simulator. It's just another round of training. Okay. Uh, thank you. I don't see any other questions and we are actually a little bit late now. So maybe we should move to the next speaker. I think that it is okay. Otio Kibata. So thank you, uh, Pavel, for your presentation. And let's see, Tokyo can share his screen and we can start already. Uh, could you can see uh, my, could you see my slide? I don't see it yet. I can hear you, but I don't see your slides. Oh. Did you share your screen? Uh, yes. Okay, now it should, okay, now there. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So, please so I will start. So today I will uh, present our study about the uh, uh, the accelerating the training of the one of the graph neural networks model. So I am going to start with success of running for graph data and its limitation. Uh, nowadays, data is represented as a graph such as social network, uh, chemical structure, and knowledge-based graph. Uh, the one of the way to process such graph data is to apply graph neural networks. Uh, it's called uh, GNN to retrieve latent information in the graph data. There are mainly three taxes for GNNs, uh, reputation learning, uh, ring prediction, and the graph isomorphism determination. Uh, for example, uh, in the real world, uh, this method is applied for item recommendation, uh, like uh, Pinterest. Uh, Pinterest is an application that recommends uh, pictures to users. In this example, data is stored as an undirected and undirectional graph. And uh, the graph has over three billion nodes and uh, 70 burial edges. For such a graph, GNNIS has shown successful results. On the other hand, as you can see the figure on the slide, uh, a graph may contain di direction and uh, attributes of edges, uh, such as is friend of. Uh, for example, Mark is a friend of Charlie, but Charlie is not friend of Mark. Uh, it is a little bit sad for him, all right? So therefore, the model is required to capture the edge attributes and direction in order to solve the tasks. However, running a directed and liberational graph has been still challenging for GNN, especially for RGCN. Uh, it's uh, the state of the art method. Since the, the relational graph contains attributes for each edge, uh, we need to model such attributes in order to solve the task. Uh, this results in huge model in RGCN and it struggles to train the model on GPU. Therefore, it is often trained and uh, executed only on CPUs. Uh, which hinders the application to the large size of graph data. Uh, in order to uh, realize its limitation, I will explore our allegation in detail before introducing our proposal. Uh, the relational graph is often composed of many uh, edge types representing the relationship between edges and nodes. Uh, in our regime, in order to capture the relationship between nodes, when the matrices for each type of edge uh, edge, ne edge needs to be defined. Since a large size of durational graph consists of many, many kind of edge types, the, the number of weight matrices for each type of edge can be very large, uh, resulting in the large size of the model in our region. Moreover, the input layer can be large when the initial node features are defined by 100 vector of the node ID if the number of no types are large. Uh, therefore, it struggles to train such a huge model on GPU due to the out of memory. Uh, this slide shows the output of our uh, the, the equation is, uh, is the node editing operation in our regime. The model defines that which matrix for each edge type to capture the direction and attributes of the graph. Also, in order to run editing of the uh, target node, it requires to pass the Feature of the target node persisted by our previous layer to the current layer. Therefore, the self loops are added to nodes to resolve this. 
the figure describes the process of computing the nodes. Firstly, the adjacent nodes with the same edge type. Then the embedding for each node in the group is uh, processed by a corresponding weight matrix. This procedure is repeated for each edge type and a direction and summed up over the resulting features. Finally, a few new feature of uh, target node is obtained by applying a rectified linear unit function to the sum feature. Um, in RGCN, it also applies regularization technique such that the weight matrix is represented by a linear, a linear combination of the base matrices and uh, the coefficients specific to each edge type and direction in order to reduce the amount number of vulnerable parameters and uh, prevent uh, overfitting for edge types which occur less frequently. However, as the model size is uh, still represented by uh, order of the number of nodes, uh, number of relation type, and the uh, uh, dimension size of hidden layer. Uh, uh, it's gross as the scale of the graph increases. So, therefore, the model does not often fit in memory of a single GPU. So, how can we train this model on GPU for large graph data? So, in this work, we propose a method to train our GCN model given a large graph input uh, on GPU. Our method is also able to accelerate the training speed due to the use of GPUs. Our method consists of two components, graph partitioning and module partitioning, in order to reduce the model size of our GCN for large graph data. In the graph partitioning, a uh, graph is divided by uh, edge types so that the each subgraph is small enough. In the model partitioning, we distribute weight matrices to submodel according to edge types and uh, generate each, each submodel on GPU. Firstly, I will introduce the graph partitioning. Since an original graph data is often rush, we divide a graph into several portions by each edge type and the graph direction. The figure described uh, the example of apply, applying edge attribute wise partitioning to a graph with four edge attributes. To begin with, the graph is divided into portions having uh, the same edge type. Uh, after it, the, by assembling the divided portions, uh, we construct subgraphs. There are several methods for assembly of portions, but in our work, uh, we distributed them so that the number of edge types is as equal as possible between subgraphs. In detail, firstly, the portions are sorted by the number of edges in descending order. Then portions are repeatedly assigned from one to n and n to one subgraph, one by one according to the order of the sort. Uh, this method is expect expected to not only smooth the number of edge types, but also to to make the number of edges as close as possible for each other. In this graph partitioning method, the edges are uniquely divided into any of the graph subgraphs, uh, whereas uh, the nodes exist across multiple graphs, subgraphs. Uh, this redundancy of nodes among subgraphs is re necessary to reproduce the model algorithm of uh, our uh, original algorithm of our regime, even when using partitioning. Um, next, I will introduce the model partitioning. As already mentioned in the previous slide, our original model is often too large to fit in G GPU device memory. For this reason, uh, in order to use GPUs to accelerate the training and execution, uh, the model partitioning is required to scale down the model size to our GPU implementable size. To solve this issue, I divide a layer into two sub processes matrix operation and uh, addition operation. Then the model executes uh, matrix operation on GPU and add addition operation on GPU. In order to divide a model to reduce the size, we decompose matrix operations into several submodels. Each submodel uh, generates uh, weight matrices corresponding to the edge types in each sub subgraph. To compute weight matrices following the regularization uh, for RGCN, a uh, set of the base matrices V 
must be shared among submodels. Then, then in each submodel, the weight matrices are generated by a linear co combination of the base matrices V and a set of coefficients A specific to edge types. In the input layer, we expect that the re reduction ratio of submodel size against the original model size is better than the proportion of the number of divisions because the number of nodes in, in each subgraph is less than uh, original graph. Uh, the dimension size of initial node feature uh, represented by the one hertz vector of node ID will be also small. In detail, the space complexities of uh, weight matrices for input area is order of number of uh, relation type in subgraph, uh, number of uh, nodes in subgraph, and the uh, dimension size of hidden layer. To train and, execute, uh, train and execute our model, we implemented these submodels on GPU in the following two ways. Uh, one using multi GPUs and the other using a single GPU. First of all, I will introduce the method using CPU and uh, multiple GPUs. We call this setting parallel ex execution with multiple GPUs. The figure shows the execution of matrix operation with CPU and uh, plus multi GPU setting. First step is uh, first step is to co copy original graph attributes, which are required to execute matrix operation to subgraphs. Uh, then the uh, attributes are sent to each GPUs. The matrix operation with submodels, uh, which are on different GPUs, is executed in parallel. Uh, as an exception, we execute the operation for self group on the same GPUs, uh, same GPU with the submodels there. At, uh, at the end of matrix operation, the results are stored in edges as message in each subgraph, and then copied to edges on the parent graphs, graph on GPU. After all the processes on GPUs end, on the parent graph gets the results, we execute addition rate operation on GPU, and the, the new node features are obtained. The sets of execution are stacked as layers in the model. Uh, next, uh, CPU and uh, so CPU plus multi GPU setting requires multiple GPUs, but this may not be enable in some cases uh, due to cost, power consumption, or machine configuration limitations. Therefore, we introduce an um, uh, implementation with a single GPU based on RG chain's graph and model partitioning. In the CPU plus multi GPU setting, subgraphs and uh, submodels are distributed among multiple GPUs for parallel, for parallel processing. On the other hand, in the CPU plus one GPU setting, the models which are processed in parallel in the CPU plus multiple GPU setting are sequentially generated and processed on, the, on a single GPU. Uh, this slide shows the flow of the execution with CPU plus one GPU setting. This method is able to deal with uh, large graph data to solve a task without increasing computational resources, whereas uh, only GPU struggles to deploy all weight matrices at, at once on the GPU, resulting in the out of memory. So, to evaluate our method, uh, we compare the training time of the four implementations. Uh, the first uh, two, uh, two methods of them is our method CPU plus multi GPU setting and the CPU plus uh, one GPU. And the two of them is as a baseline, uh, CPU only, only setting and the GPU only settings. Uh, which are executed with the code provided by DGL. It's a DG deep graph library, which is a deep graph network library of Python, and they use Py PyTorch as backend. We also use three data sets of different sizes. Uh, BGS and AM are the data sets of uh, British Geological Survey data and the collection of uh, questions in Amsterdam Museum, respectively. We also create a middle-sized dataset by Barabasha Vault model. The model is, the, is an algorithm for generating 
uh, random graph data, which is close to data seen in real world. In this, in this experiment, we work on entity classification tasks to evaluate our method. For architecture, we use two layer RGC in the model. The evaluation environment is as shown in the table at the bottom right. So, in order to verify that our portion assembly way in the graph partitioning processes, process where the sub, subgraph is constructed based on edge types is better. Uh, we first compare our portion assembly method with the one based on the number of edges. In this method, we set the maximal number of edges contained in each subgraph as number of all edges divided by the number of divisions. Then the portions are distributed so that they do not exceed the threshold. These figures show, uh, these figures show the ratio of memory size of weight matrices in each, in each submodels of input layer compared to the original memory size of weight matrices when the model is divided into four sub submodels. Uh, as you can see the graph, uh, the figure, in all the data sets, uh, the largest ratio of the subgraph generated by the edge type based assembly method is smaller than, than the largest ratio of the subgraph generated by the edge number, uh, edge number based assembly method. In random graph, uh, ratio of sub two generated by the number edge number based method is over 25%. In other words, uh, it is worse than the proportion of the number of divisions. Therefore, our method generally shows better performance for the graph partitioning. From here, uh, we will focus on the result of the edge type based uh, method. The size of submodules in hidden layer and output layer are proportional to the number of divisions. On the other hand, the portion, proportion of uh, each submodule size of input layer is expected to be smaller than the uh, proportion of the number of divisions because the number of nodes in subgraph is uh, is smaller than the number of nodes in parent graph. The figure indicates that all the submodel sizes are less than 25% of the original size of the weight matrices in input area. In detail, the largest size of submodels for each data is almost 4% smaller than 25%. Uh, Due to the structure of each graph, uh, there is a bias in, in the rate, rate of shrinkage between data sets. For example, in BGS data set, uh, the types of edges tend to be similar. So therefore, by positioning a graph, some subgraphs would contain smaller than smaller number of nodes since the redundant nodes uh, are removed. As a result, sub, sub models zero and uh, one are much smaller than the others. In contrast, uh, its types in AM and random graph are equally di distributed on the graph graphs. That's why the size of some models are re relatively equal. This this rather result illustrates the difficulty of graph partitioning caused by the diversity of graph structures. Um, so using data on Euclidean space like pictures, it is easy to divide the data. However, on graph data, each node have different degree depends on, depending on graph structure. And then it is difficult to propose a partitioning method that can be expected to produce similar results for various graph structures. Therefore, investigating a more efficient assembly method is one of the, our uh, future work. Next, uh, we evaluate the acceleration performance of CPU plus 4 GPU setting. First, uh, although the data set were, uh, were also executed with GPU only setting, uh, the out of GPU memory occurred for AM and random graph data set. 
especially for AM, the size of weight matrices on the input layer was over 17 gigabyte, which explicitly demonstrates uh, as the necessity of the proposed, proposed model portioning uh, on a regression model with uh, large graph data. Similarly, for random graph, uh, the size of weight matrices of the input layer is about 6.5 gigabyte, but uh, out of memory occurred in the back propagation because the parameter updates also requires nearly the same amount of memory as the weight matrix. matrix. Uh, this motivates as the graph and the model portioning. Uh, portioning. Also, we may remark that uh, GPU plus for GPU setting can accelerate the model training for all the data sets compared to GPU setting. 3.8 times for VGS, 3.2 times for AM, and 2.6 times for the random graph, uh, faster than CPU. We, mo we noticed that in the backward phase for updating the parameters, uh, CPU plus the GPU setting is advantageous. On the other hand, in the forward phase, its advantage is not as much as in the back end phase because the data transfer overhead becomes significant and uh, uh, the addition, addition version is uh, executed on CPU. Uh, please note that if our target graph data is smaller enough to execute GPU only setting, this setting is best choice. Now I am going to show the abbreviation study for number of GPUs in GPU plus smart GPU setting. Uh, these results show that the execution speed gets faster as we increase the number of GPUs. However, the acceleration rate is smaller even though we, uh, uh, even though we increase the number of GPUs. We assume that this is due to the additional operation on the GPU and it's also caused by the data exchange cost between GPU and GPU is it, in field forward phase and parameters synchronization between GPUs in backward phase. For AM data set, the out of memory happened in the execution with less than four GPUs. Therefore, we did not include it here. These results show the abbreviation study for divisions in, uh, in GPU plus uh, one GPU system. As you can see the, see the graphs, uh, the execution speed get faster as the number of divisions decreases. We assume that it's, it is because the number of data exchange decreases and uh, also the matrix operation is more efficient if the size of matrix is larger. So the execution can be optimized by reducing the number of portions to the extent the, the there is no out of memory. Though CPU plus one GPU setting is slow, though the CPU plus one GPU setting is slower than CPU plus March, uh, March GPU setting, it is still faster than CPU only setting. For AM dataset, we tried CPU plus one GPU setting with until six divisions as well, but the execution were stopped due to the out of memory. It is because neural networks uh, requires storing, storing a computation tree to execute back to propagation and the computation tree occupy the uh, GPU device memory. For the same reason, uh, for random graph, uh, GPU plus one GPU setting with three division uh, did not work, although GPU plus multiple GPUs setting with three GPUs worked. In order to resolve this issue, the mini-batch training is a potential solution because it allows, allows uh, GPUs re release a memory allocation for frequency. Uh, so conclusion, for conclusion, uh, in this work, we introduced a method of edge, edge attribute-wise graph partitioning and multi partitioning to accelerate uh, training and execution of RG RGN for large scale graphs uh, using GPUs. Uh, moreover, uh, we show that our method su successfully accelerates the training speed on large graph datasets. In future work, uh, we would like to introduce more efficient method for assembly of portions on graph partitioning, uh, mini batch training for sequential GPU memory re release, and increasing the number of GPUs to handle more uh, larger graph data. Uh, thank you for attention. Thank you for your presentation, Tokyo. So I invite now questions for uh, 
this uh, presentation. In the meantime, uh, I've seen that you have running into some uh, memory capacity problems when you use uh, very large graphs and a single, even two GPUs. I agree that Minimatch uh, could be one possible solution to these problems. Another one would be to try to compress uh, your problem using some compression techniques like lowering precision or, or uh, dropping entries for the model. So have you explored any of these two techniques to, to try to reduce the memory uh, uh, usage of your model? Uh, sorry, I, I don't get well the, your question. Uh, could you see? Yeah, I the, the question is that uh, you are running into memory capacity problems. Yes. And in order to address these problems, you propose to use minimatch training. So uh, minimatch another training. possibility would be to try to reduce the size of your, your model by applying some compression or pruning techniques to the model. The question is uh, uh, then whether you have considered this alternative. So, uh, the minimatch training is uh, the reducing the the, uh, the 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 graph data, so it's okay. But uh, it needs to also the model part uh, more. Uh, so we need to uh, reduce the model more, uh, better than the now. But I think it is uh, realized by the uh, the two ways. Uh, one way is, is uh, uh, so the, in the case of the March, uh, GPU, GPU plus March GPU setting, uh, it is one of the solution is uh, about it's simply simple that uh, it's increased. Uh, it is solved by the increasing the number of GPUs, but it is difficult. It, the, the difficulty of the solution is uh, uh, the, there, are, there is a limitation of the number of GPUs uh, connected to a, a machine, a, a single machine. So it is a bottleneck of the, the solution. So I need to uh, consider about that uh, for future works. So I don't have any uh, solution for now. Okay. Uh, yes, and uh, for GP plus March GP setting is uh, the, the model is uh, reduced by the, by the number of divisions so it is uh, uh, it it is possible uh, theoretically uh, by increasing the number of divisions. So it is uh, infinitely possible. But the problem is uh, uh, the computation tree is occupied memory. So it is solved by the minibatch uh, training. I think okay. uh, I I can respond to your question. Uh, yes. Um, okay. Second question is, uh, it seems that there is a, a, another bottleneck in the communication, in the GPU communication. They seem to be uh, rather expensive in your case. I didn't see in the, in the experimental setup, in the description of experimental setup, whether you are using some sort of uh, high speed connection between the GPUs or they are just connected via the regular PCI Express in your experiments. Uh, yeah, it's, it's realized by PCI Express, so. So maybe the, connect, the, the, the communication uh, bottleneck that you are uh, seeing now, which doesn't yeah. show uh, uh, too large improvement when going from three to four GPUs, for example, could be uh, improved or solved by using uh, something uh, that is uh, the, uh, well, the, the MB-Link communication. Yes, it is one of the solution. And uh, now, for now, I use a simple uh, function uh, provided by uh, Python for realizing the communication between uh, GPU plus GPU and uh, uh, the scheduling the parallel execution. So there is a, a, a there are many. It it is not optimized for now. So uh, I think it is uh, reduced the, the program uh, by uh, 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 making a scheduling, using a scheduling, I think. Okay. Okay. So I don't see any questions in Slack. If anybody wants to ask a question, please do so. So otherwise, I think it's time for 